Watching your MBA podcast purpose is to help existing business owners grow their companies to have the $10 million in revenue per year benchmark. Here is your host, Stephen Halasnik. Welcome, everyone. My name is Stephen Halasnik. Over the last 25 years, I've built six companies in the $5 million to $25 million range. And I can't tell you how important it is for a business to have a line of credit so they can make an investment in their business or even for unexpected emergencies. Our line of credit program is easy to, to get in place, inexpensive when used, and costs nothing to set up, making it a great cash backup plan. If you would like to learn more about our line of credit program, please visit us at fscreditline.com. That's FS as in Financing Solutions, creditline.com. Or give us a call at 862-207-4118. If you apply today, we will even give you a $250 credit on file. Just remember the time to set up a credit line is when you don't need it. So that when you do need it, it's ready to go. Today, I am very excited to be speaking with Michael Solomon. Michael wrote the book on understanding consumers, literally. Hundreds of thousands of business students have learned about marketing from his books, including consumer behavior, buying, having, and being. The most widely used book on the subject in the world. Michael's mantra, we don't buy products because of what they do, we buy them because of what they mean. He advises global clients in leading industries such as apparel and footwear, example, Calvin Klein and Levi Strauss, Under Armour, Timberland, financial services and e-commerce such as eBay, Progressive, CPG, Procter & Gamble, Campbell's, retailing, H&M, sports, Philadelphia Eagles, manufacturing, DuPont, P&G, and transportation, BMW, United Airlines, on a marketing strategies to make them more consumer centric. He regularly appears on television shows, including the Today Show, Good Morning America, and CNN to comment on consumer issues. And he's frequently quoted on in major media outlets, such as the New York Times, USA Today, Adweek, and Time. As a professor of marketing in the Hobbes School of Business at St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia, and an industry consultant, Michael combines cutting edge academic theory and actionable real world strategy. He helps managers get inside the heads of their customers so, that, so they can anticipate and satisfy their deepest and most pressing needs today and tomorrow. An executive of Subaru said it best, the man is a scholar who, who is current and streetwise. Michael, welcome to today's Entrepreneur MBA podcast. Hi, Stephen. Thanks so much for having me on. Oh, it's great to have you. And you know, I, I usually will not do that long of an intro, <laughs> but when I go to look at the intro, I, you know, it's it's good. It's really good and it's Thank helpful. You. And I think it really, you know, we, it's I think it's something that we needed to be uh, 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 said. So, uh, you know, this the, today's topic is understanding the new consumer to grow business and. Uh, you know, my, my first question to you is, uh, uh, you know, what, how can you tell as an expert with snow in the roof, which is gray hair, <laughs> right? Me too. All right. Which means that it's good information. Well, I'm happy to um, have snow left at all. So, uh. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Um, well, with, with your experience, how can you tell that a business is not paying attention to its consumer? Well, uh, it's probably going to be reflected in, in their revenues, but uh, yeah. in, in the long term, you know, um, but usually, you know, if you if you if you talk to customers and by the way, that's the first sign that a business isn't succeeding if they're not talking to their customers constantly. Um, you know, when you if you do talk to them and they're not really passionate about what you sell, or what you do you probably have a problem, you know, because, uh, you know, what, what I like to say is that, you know, we don't buy things because of what they do. We buy them because of what they mean. And that's certainly true for most consumer facing goods and, and a lot of B2B products as, as well. You know, they need it needs to have a story behind it. And we can dive more into that if, if you want. But, you know, the reality is, and, you know, you're, I think your listeners don't have to be convinced of this, you know, just about any vertical you might enter, there's a ton of competition there. And a lot of it's coming from very well entrenched brands or, or 
services that have been, you know, doing that for a long time. And so if you're, if you're trying to grow a new business, you, you know, unless you have some incredibly, you know, some incredible technological advantage over the others, you know, uh, uh, you're probably not going to grow just because people think your product is better. It's got to be also more appealing to them and be a part of, of what they're trying to do with their life. So um, whether you're a large or small business, really, it, it's all about the brand that you have and the brand that you want to have and all of the steps that you do to make sure that that gets communicated to your customers. Because a lot of times business owners have it in their heads exactly the kind of brand they want to be, but their customers are not necessarily repeating that back to them when they when they talk to them. Yeah, you know, I think, I wonder if you can look at the growth of their competition in your space. And if someone is growing at, you know, a 20% clip and you're growing at a, you know, 5% clip. Mm -hmm. If you can point, uh, if you can kind of point to this and say, are we really, really diving into our customers? Um, you know, I think it's tough. You know, if you got a, you know, a billion dollar competitor and you're, you know, a $5 million company, certainly, uh, you know, a billion dollar competitor to grow at 20% is like crazy. Uh, but, you know, I wonder, I wonder what, the, I mean, the reason I bring that up is that everybody knows who's in business, that the customers has to, and is supposed to come first, right? We all know that, right. right? But yet when it comes to, you know, the implementation of that, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's hard to tell if you're doing a great job in that area. Yeah, you know, one one of the, the the issues that I've discovered in working with some clients over the years is that is that in many cases we tend to we tend to think about the customer that we want to have rather than than the one we actually have, and we kind of market to that ideal customer, which, by the way, is often a, a mirror image of ourselves. You know, we just kind of mm. project ourselves onto others. But you know, that's why they make chocolate and vanilla. I mean, there you're probably not exactly like your customers. And so it's important to, to uh, you know, you, you can't, I'm sure in your show and in, within your consulting business and so on, you, you talk about various milestones that people have to hit, you know, but you can't really hit those milestones until you know what the milestones are. In, and I don't mean just dollar milestones. I mean, in terms of customer loyalty and, and awareness and, you know, whatever your objectives happen to be. So, um, yeah, I mean, even and even if you're growing at a small clip, um, I think the most the single biggest weapon that um, that a small business has over those billion dollar guys is nimbleness, right, is agility. And I'm sure you've talked yeah. about that many times. And uh, you know, when, when Procter and Gamble needs to make a change, you know, they're very, very good at understanding their customers, but it's like turning a battleship, right? So you've got, uh, you might be competing against the battleship, but you're the guy in that little motorboat that's able to whiz around them, you know? So in, so in a sense that, that formidable size can actually be a disadvantage if, if you're in a more niche business. And again, you, you're able to change and grow with your customers in ways that the big guys can't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, one of the things all small businesses want to be bigger businesses. Um, and the, the uh, I think one of the things being that I'm a small business owner um, is I think we tend to forget one of our, you know, the ACE in, in your hand and the ACE in your hand is, is, that you can be personable, right? You know, Procter Gamble cannot be personable, okay? But you can, and I think, you know, I'm a big proponent of this adage, which is, you know, you want to be able to work on your business, not in your business. And but the idea too is, you also don't want to be working so much on your business that you lose that small business capability of being personable. And, and uh, it may not just be the owner's personable, but the people that you hire for you, you know, the idea behind a family owned business, so to speak, is I think the expectation from the customer for a family owned business is two things. One is that 
you're going to uh, honor your commitments. You're going to honor, you're, you're more honorable. And number two is you're going to work harder, uh, you know, for, for their dollar. And uh, number three is, you know, that you're readily available if there's a problem. And that's, you know, a great way to compete against a Procter & Gamble. Now, of course, the most important is you got to have a niche, right? right. That Procter & Gamble. I mean, if you're going to go out there and sell uh, diapers, you know, uh, you know, uh, the, I, I think Procter Gamble is still involved in diapers, are they? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Then <laughs> just a few um, billion better, dollars worth a year. <laughs> <laughs> that he better have a damn good diaper. I don't know. I don't, it, it'd be kind of crazy to go into it, but um, what, from a, you know, you teach and you teach these, these business students. Um, I'm not sure. Is it on an MBA level well, both. as well? Undergrad, yeah, MBA, whatever they throw at me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I'm going to raise this question because, you know, I was involved in something called birthing the giants at MIT and it was a, 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 a three-year program executive. And it was, um, one week a year with 60 of the fastest growing companies in the United States. I had it with one of my other companies and uh, actually 60, 60 fastest growing companies in the world, not just the United States. And I, and I'm going to tell you when an academic came in to talk to us, we literally ran them out of the room because <laughs> they were, they were so out of touch. Now I, uh, you consult, so that's cool. But, uh, you know, so I think that doesn't put the same thing in, into play. But what is the difference between theory that you read about in a book and execution? You know, where, where does that usually break down? Yeah, well, well, first of all, shame on that, on him or her for um, making you guys do that to them because they, shouldn't, they should know their audience better, right? Um, having said that, if you probably were premature in throwing them out because they may, they may have had some contributions on the, the theoretical side. You may say, well, what use is a theory? I'm all about practice, you know? Uh, well, we did that, and, but that's you know, okay. if you look, if, <laughs> and actually, if you look at my email signature, I have a quote from a social scientist that says there's nothing so practical as a good theory. And the reason that I, I love that quotation is, is that it really speaks to everything that I, you know, my entire career, which has been with kind of one foot in the ivory tower and one foot, you know, on, on the business side. Um, a good theory is very, very valuable, not just to some pointy headed academic. Um, it's, it's valuable because it gets to some of the underlying dynamics or reasons for the things you're, you're observing. And the things that you're observing on the surface are going to change. You know, when you look at consumer behavior, uh, obviously our behavior is changing quite rapidly these days. But if you understand theoretically the reasons why people are making the connections that they do, you're in a better position the, the next time, you know, the next change that happens, which will probably be next week, um, you'll, you'll have some understanding of that because it will encourage you to think more longitudinally, you know, so you don't have to reinvent the light bulb every time there's a change in, in your business. So, for example, uh, when, you know, when we look at, at when people buy things, obviously they have a lot of different motivations to do that. There's no one reason to buy something. And if I can get a little deeper and understand why my customers happen to be interested in whatever I'm offering, a financial service like you have or a can of peas or whatever it is, uh, that gives me a much a kind of a broader and, and more enriched understanding of the business that I'm in. So, you know, the short answer is, as, as I said, you, the theory gives you the ability to avoid reinventing that light bulb every single time you have to make mm. a decision. And I, wow. and I know it's hard for people to grasp that when they're worried about what they're going to do this quarter or next quarter. Yeah. So having the luxury to look at the long term, I mean, that's, that's one, that's one advantage that, quite honestly, academics do have because we're able to sit. We don't have that pressure, most of us, to grow the bottom line unless our deans are leaning on us to grow the number of, because we're in business too, you know, uh, yeah. to grow the number of students we get and all that. But, um, but you know, 
if it's done properly, you know, for example, one of the one of the things that I value or really appreciate about my career is I, I have I didn't have to, you know, start in a vertical and just stay in that vertical. I've had the opportunity to see what folks are doing in a lot of different verticals, you know, from from really tangible stuff to financial services or, or whatever. And what that allows you to do is to benchmark not just against your immediate competitors, but to kind of get a sense of how people in other verticals, very different from yours, are still solving the same problems. Because I don't care what you're selling, you still, when it comes to consumer behavior, you're solving the same problems. And having that broader understanding that theory gives you can can be very helpful. But I do get it that it's one thing to know it, another thing to be able to communicate it. <laughs> yeah, well, again, you like you said, you have a foot in each side. So I think that that's really, if you can combine theory and practical, that's the best of both worlds, right? Um, because you know, you, you're able to think and then see if it, if it worked, right? right? Right. So, so for example, well, if I, I, if I can plug something I'm working on, I'm going to to release a, uh, in a few weeks, an online course on engaging your customers, how to engage your customers and ramp up their excitement with what you're doing. And there's an example where that's a, that's a huge problem, um, that people tell me all the time, business owners, you know, uh, we actually do have a lot of theoretical understanding of how people's, you know, how our attention gets engaged, how we get passionate about things, how we ignore other things. So when you're looking at an issue like that, you really, you, you want to look well beyond what other people, you know, your direct competitors are doing to excite their customers, because it's likely that it's not going to work for you. They're already doing it anyway by understanding maybe some of the background of what turns people on and, and floats their boat and what doesn't, you can really make a difference in the, in the practical world. So the ideal is kind of a one-two punch where you first want to lay out the conceptual reasons why things are happening and then show how changes will, in fact, change your marketing strategy and hopefully your, your performance. Yeah, I remember. So 30 years ago, I, I worked uh, 30 plus years ago, I worked for Xerox and for eight and a half years. And back then, I remember the study that they had showed us, which was and this is, again, 30 plus years ago. Um, but when you get to when you get the client to a level of, you know, like a one to five and I forget what each one was like five was like they rated you as exceptional or something like that. Mm -hmm. When you got them in a four or a five and a four was like, you know, excellent or whatever it was. Right. Uh, when you got them at a four or five, your client at four or five, they were 99.5% kind of going to stay with you for a long time. And then not only that, they were, they were, uh, you know, uh, likely to recommend you to other people right. as well. So the, the objective of what was at zero, I was at Xerox, what you wanted to do is to get those clients into the, you know, exceptional level, not just, right. you know, satisfied. You wanted to get them above that exactly. thing. And then, again, this is 25 plus years, years ago as well. So the, the concept is still there. Yeah. The concept's still there and it still makes a lot of sense. And, you know, uh, and it actually speaks to to something that you said earlier. You know, you're talking about the, this program is about understanding consumers to grow your business. But there are other ways to grow your business in addition to attra just attracting new customers. And I think one of the mistakes that especially small business, businesses make is they think that that uh, their their success is correlated directly with the number of customers they have rather than the volume that they do with each customer, right? So you can have a relative, especially if you're a niche business, you may not have thousands and thousands of customers, but man, if each, if each of those customers is spending with you on a regular basis, why do you need, you know, why do you need that tail end? You, you want to focus more on the lifetime value of, of your existing customers and upsell them, get more value. If they, if they like you already, it's that much easier to sell them more things that you might do 
rather than convincing a stranger on the street to give you a try. So I'm not saying don't go after new people, don't get me wrong, but that tends to be kind of a single-minded obsession, I think, with a lot of people. You know, how many people visited our website? Well, you know, as, as you know, you can visit websites all day long. It doesn't mean you're going to be a loyal customer of that company. So I would urge your listeners, don't just equate growth with number of whatevers, right? But uh, but rather, uh, what is the, you know, on a yearly basis, how much does that customer buy from you and reward those customers who are really exceptionally loyal? Yeah, you know what? I know what the problem is, and um, I'll state it that way. And that is, you know, execution is not sexy. Right. You know, execute. And so, you know, you probably can pick two or three things that your business can do for now until doomsday. Uh, and, you know, one of them, of course, being take incredibly excellent care of your existing clients and have programs in place right. that take care of your existing clients. Right. But it's just so hard to stay focused on three things. You know, you read a, you know, a new book by, you know, Michael Solomon and, you know, uh, and you're like, Oh, that's a great idea. You know, we got to do that. And then you read another book by Peter Drucker. Well, his own, well, not Peter Drucker, but you know, that's an older book, Peter Drucker. And you're like, that's a great idea. You know, and you know, you you try to do too much. And then when it comes to just executing and just staying focused on that over and over, that's why I, I you know, on a, it, it's not a bad idea to have a coach. And if that coach can keep you on track, that's a good way as well. But you know, they could be uh also liking the shiny new object as well. What do you think? Well, I don't know. That's why I got married, but you know, that, that's my coach. To keep you on track. Yeah, keep me on track. <laughs> uh, yeah, I agree. You know, you do need to stay focused. You need to stay focused on your core mission, yeah. but there can be, you know, if your mission statement is, is uh, focused enough, you can, it it does give you the latitude to to grow new new businesses that are that are similar. You know, if you think about a company I'm familiar with, Under Armour. You mm -hmm. know, so their underlying mission is basically to make performance athletic gear that makes it easier to do sports, right? But over the years, what they've been able to do without straying from their mission statement is to branch out into other into other sports. You know, for example, they make fishing gear now, I think. And, uh, you know, that's not something that they would have started with, yet they haven't strayed because they're still making performance enhancing athletic wear, you know? Mm -hmm. So once you, if it, it's so crucial, a lot of people, I, my guess is a lot of your listeners don't have a mission statement, <laughs> but right. it's pretty important to have one. I don't know if that's something you've talked about, but, um, it's not just check the box. It's not, you know, it's not all about just making the best products to make people's lives happy and shiny, right? Uh, it's it it's really understanding the business that you're in and understanding that that business is not about the functionality that you're building into products or services. It's what people are getting out of it, you know. So so that allows you to kind of revision your business. So let's take an obvious example, Netflix. Everybody knows this story. Right? So Netflix is, you know, is is not in the uh, it's in the entertainment business, you know. And of course, back in the day, you know, and, and, and you and you you've got your your uh, share of snow on the roof. You remember when we used to go to stores to oh, pick yeah. up videotapes, Blockbuster right? My, and yeah. You know, my students have no idea what that means. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, what Net Netflix figured out is that, is that what they're selling is instant gratification in terms of mm. entertainment. Now, yeah, how, you get, how you deliver it, you know, they used to send it through the U.S. Postal Service, which is yep. a scary thought. So, um, again, they haven't strayed from their mission, but they're flexible enough to be able to say, well, now there are new ways to deliver those benefits that people are looking for. Yeah, I'll just, I'll tag on to something that you said, um, which is, listen, I, I firmly believe that your number, the, that what a, 
entrepreneur or a business owner does is they take calculated risks. They don't take risks. They take calculated risks. Hmm. And if you can reduce the downside and increase the upside, then your chances of success is really high. And that's, you know, I've, I've done that my whole career. And, and, uh, and I, I would, so, and I believe that really wholeheartedly in my heart that if you, if you have a mission statement, if you have a defined culture that you understand that you, that you uh, permeate throughout the organization, if you understand your values uh, as an organization, and if you have a plan that you are reducing your downside of failure and increasing your probability of success. Mm-hmm. And therefore, if you don't have those things, you're leaving it up to chance higher that you will fail. And when I, you know, cause so many of the business owners that I know and I've met, you know, they, they don't have a business, they don't plan. Right. And I'm not talking about a 20 page business plan. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm talking about a one pager. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but without having those, I believe you run the risk of failure. And so I really believe that those things that people preach about are really important for small businesses to have. What do you yeah. think? Well, it's yeah, I cert I certainly agree with that. You know, I would a couple of, of comments I would make. One one is that it's great to have these plans, but you need to have some metrics in place yeah. to know whether or not it's the not KPIs. just oh, I think we're doing pretty well. You know, it needs yeah. to be now whether you don't make your milestones, that's okay, but at least you're you're getting feedback and and hopefully you're changing based on that, because, you know, as you know, the definition of insanity, right, is doing the same thing over <laughs> and over again, over and hoping over. for a different result. So you yeah, don't that's want how we got our, want That's how we got our snow on the roof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, exactly. Yeah. But, you know, but when you talk about these risks, yes, there's always risks because there's always unknowns. How having said that, however, uh, to the extent that you actually contest your ideas before you launch them full scale, you're going to reduce that risk quite a bit, assuming yeah. that the customers you tested on are similar to the ones that you're going after. You know, it can't yeah. be, you know, you show something to your wife and she says, oh, you're wonderful. And she hasn't told you that in 30 years. So you want to go out and sell that, but she's not in your customer base. You know, it has, but to the extent that you can get that kind of feedback on a small scale before you roll things out and just say, well, I'm taking a risk. Um, there, again, you, there's always, if, if there's no risk, there's no, there's no reward. Right. Uh, but having said that there are ways to reduce that risk because the, the best predictor of future behavior, consumer behavior, any kind of behavior is past behavior. Yeah, it's not a hundred percent by any means, yeah. but knowing how your customers have responded, you know, in, in this situation, does give you some insights. There's where that theory comes in again, does give you that insights about the next situation. So it's not just an ad hoc, okay, now what do we do kind of thing? Because we've seen this before. We haven't, we haven't seen it in this exact same way, but we've seen this, you know, yearning for a new whatever, and we're able to adapt them. So let's, let's get to the practical side a little bit. And uh, we talked about, you know, the, the topic is an understanding the new consumer to grow your business. So what are some of the ideas that you've seen that, uh, that companies, not the big guys, but the smaller, maybe some of the smaller ones that you've worked with, what do, what do you think are some best practices or, or some things that they do to really understand their customer? Yeah, well, that's a, you know, I could, uh, I could talk for about 40 hours on that, but I don't think we want to do that. <laughs> Um, you know, I talk about if I, again, if I can insert a quick plug for my, my latest book is called the new chameleons and it's about these new customers and how they're so different than from what they were in the past. And I think Mm. that business owners really need to understand that. And, you know, I guess, you know, I guess what's helped me is having to stand in front of 20 year olds several times a week and keep them, keep their attention for an hour or two to kind of get a sense of what they're thinking. Um, not that I claim to understand it, by the way, but, um, you know, when you look at these younger people in particular, you, you see that 
that the fund, some very fundamental ways that they think about the marketplace and they think about brands and their obligations to brands and brands obligations to them are really, really different than what we assume. And so you, you, you really need to kind of dive in and get a sense of what these people are thinking, even if your customer base is not composed of, let's say, millennials or Gen Yers. Uh, you know, so, so for example, I talk in, in, in the book about some very fundamental assumptions that we all make. Uh, and I teach these assumptions to my students, for example, about market segmentation and how you define your customer base. And so uh, there, you know, for there's a great example where something that worked great in the past no longer works as well. And that and that's this notion of dividing, let's let's say, for example, the U.S. market into large homogeneous groups that share certain characteristics, you know, women in their 30s who live in urban areas or something like that. Well, that. You know, that was uh, actually, you know, the segmentation was pioneered by General Motors back as a reaction to, you know, Ford. You probably Ford. heard Henry Ford's mm. famous comment, my customers can have their car any color they want as long as it's black. Yeah. And General Motors said, well, you know what? Not everybody wants that. Maybe maybe we can start to develop products for different segments, you know, and that that worked great back in the last century when we lived in a kind of a mass market broadcasting environment with maybe three television stations, you know, everybody, you kind of knew where to find everybody on a Sunday night. They were watching Ed Sullivan or something, you know. Uh, now, obviously today, that's no longer the case. You know, even if you look on TV, with you know, thousands of channels who know even knows what they are, but but there's probably something on there for just about anybody. And so what we have today are sometimes what we call microcultures that are much smaller groups that reflect the fact that we live in a very fragmented society where we each identify with a lot of different groups. Uh, and it has to do with gender and subcultures and, and also uh, uh, aesthetic choices like music and food, you know, people might, people who are into microbreweries are going to unite around that and share, you know, product recommendations and so on. And, and so that broad-based approach, that kind of cookie cutter approach where everybody, you know, if they share certain basic characteristics, they're going to respond the same way, doesn't really work in, in today's environment where we can often literally talk about a market of one, where you know, if I have a message or a product, I can tailor it to what Stephen wants. And it might be slightly different than, than, you know, the next person who gets that. And when you were talking about small business, that's where the advantage is, because you can personalize and customize and tailor your delivery to that individual. Now, the big guys can do it online, right? They can, you know, they can yeah. buy Facebook ads that, that yeah. reflect where you've been, et cetera. And the and small guys, of course, can do that too. But the small businesses can do it much more on a much more interpersonal, you know, in, uh, basis that that really can help them to um, to to build a bond with, with these people that, as you said earlier, you know, the P&Gs of the world are not able to do that. So I guess you could even say, all right, let me look at my competition here. And let me see how I can make my company more personal, right? Uh, you know, and, and, you know, I'm using that word loosely, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, rather it be through technology, rather it through, be through face-to-face -face meetings, rather it be through, uh, you know, whatever, knowing your product better than, every, than the, your, your, well, that's a little different. But, you know, but I, I think if you come up with that theory, right, here we mm -hmm. go back to the theory, and that is, a company that's more personable is going to be uh, to have higher customer satisfaction. Thus, we're going to drive revenue because of that and probably gross profit margin as well. Right. If you start off with that theory and then you work your way back and say, OK, now, what are the top three things I think we can do? Make, maybe, maybe make a list, you know, 10, 20 things that you can do that, are, that makes your company more personable to your clients or to your prospects and then pick three and kind of implement those. 
that would be a pretty cool mission statement, right? Well, you know, cer certainly you should have something in there about, you know, evolving to meet the needs of your core customers, and yeah. et cetera. But one caution would be, you know, don't, when you, when you talk about personalizing or customizing, there's a distinction between what I, I, in some work I did for some banks, um, you know, what we found is that we, there's something that we, that I called cosmetic personalization, which is acting. Yeah. So it would be like, I have a script, but it's every now and then I insert, I say, oh, Stephen, <laughs> do you like what I'm selling? You know, yeah. that is not what we mean by personalizing the offer. Yeah. Right? So and in yeah. fact, that and can actually work against you. Yeah, and I think the issue too, is that there, you know, a month, you got to be careful that the marketing matches the deliverable. Right. 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 You don't, you know, have these ads that are personalized and then exactly yeah. you send them to an automated, exactly. you know, system, yeah. right. It's, it's got to match. Right. And I'm not talking about the Facebook personalization thing. In fact, if anything, that would be last to be changed. You, I, I think you would look at your organization and say, you know, like for, I'll give you an example, like with my company. And I actually think that my company in our discussion could be a case study for this podcast um, because we're very, very small. You know, we're very small. We have a lot of money out uh, for just a couple people. But, um, but the fact that we can, that, that our customers almost always are talking to one of the owners, you know, that is something that an entrepreneur really, really likes because when you go to a bank, you don't, you don't get that. Sure. You get, yeah. you know, you get uh, somebody who has to answer to somebody who has to answer to somebody. So you never get a straight answer. You never find out why your loan was turned down. Yeah. Right. With us, that's the number one thing we want to say, okay, listen, even if you are turned down, we're going to tell you exactly why. And uh, that comes from the owners. But um, so I think that that's, again, coming to a small business, that's where you can play something up, you know, a, an advantage. Yeah, absolutely. And also, you know, in, in let's say in a retail environment, just empowering some of your employees to make those decisions, you know, yeah. so that, you know, when people love it, if let's say a salesperson says, yeah, I can make that refund for you now. Now mm. it rarely happens, but when it yeah. does it really makes a difference. So, yeah. uh, again, don't just go through the motions, you know, it, and, and especially, you know, one of the biggest, uh, suggestions I could make is, is to think about something we call the Ikea effect, which means that, uh, you know, as, as you know, at Ikea, well, I always joke that I always have a few parts left over at the end, but if I buy a bookcase and I build that bookcase myself, that's not just another bookcase. It's mm. every time I walk by that bookcase, I'm going to think I may, I remember making that, you know? So to the extent that, that you can apply that wisdom to your own business of, you know, and it, and I don't mean that your customers have to build your product necessarily, but uh, they might have some input into some, you know, nuances about your offering. And to the extent that they can create their own offer or their own product or service, um, they are going to be much more loyal to you because literally a part of them is now residing with you. You know, I was talking to my, my son, my son's a 21 year old, uh, uh, senior at, uh, going to be a senior at Boston university and he's a computer science major. He's a really smart kid. Um, he's, he's already had seven internships, you oh. know? And, and so, I mean, it's unusual, right? But, you know, I said to him, um, you know, if, if after you graduate, you decide to go back to, to, you know, get your MBA, maybe, um, I said, what you're going to find is like this, this world of business people who, who know things and like look at businesses and you think, oh, well, this business sells these couches. And that's what they do. But then when you look inside of what they really do, if it's a really good business, you know, they, and I know how to articulate it. Maybe you can articulate it better than I can, but you're like, wow, I didn't, <laughs> I never thought that that's what they did. You know, I, I, I thought they sold couches, but when you looked inside, you know, the owner came up with this 
grand scheme of really what they do. Like, like what the example you gave with Netflix was a good example. Someone would say, oh, well, they provide right. entertainment and movies, which is not really what they do, right? They, they, as, you, as you stated, they're, they're giving people instant satisfaction, right? Yeah. And, and it's just, if you're a business owner or you're in business and it's, I think it's fascinating to find out what these businesses really do. Well, what they do, you know, what they do is they provide benefits. They sell attributes, but people buy the benefits. So when you say a store sell ca- sells couches, I would say, no, they sell relaxation. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and so you've got uh, like there's a mattress company now that's that's doing very well because they're letting people actually t- test drive the mattress by taking a nap in their store. <laughs> you know, that's what they sell. So if you sell sleep. You know, you you want to show people that that it works, and 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 there are a lot of companies, innovative companies that that understand that they're not selling the hardware, right? So, a company like REI that sells sports and camping equipment and so on. Well, they're not. You know, you're buying camping equipment, but what, you know, you're what you're really buying is a is an experience in the wilderness. And so, REI now has a has a thing. I don't know if it's still uh, in in effect where. They have camping trips with their customer. They have sales associates that take their customers out on weekends and use the equipment from the store to show them how to do it. That is a true consumption experience that those people aren't going to forget. It's not just going in and buying a, a tent pole or something. Yeah, that's why we, our company provides a cash backup plan. Uh, that's why you know we don't sell a line of credit. We sell a cash backup plan. Because, and, 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 uh, you know, I feel personally, I feel personal about it. I think that every business should have a cash backup plan. And, and, you know, the thing is, is you can't get that at a bank. It's, you know, it really, it's not, you know, what they're selling. Um, and so, you know, and, and we're passionate about it. I mean, I've been in situations where, you know, I outstrip my line of credit with a bank and then I go back to the bank and I say, I need, I'm doing really well. I'm, you know, I, you know, and I, I need to increase my line of credit and they'll say, well, I'll give you an answer in a, a month and a half. I'm like, I can't wait a month and a half, you know? Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, you know, it's something that I think we feel passionate about here as well. And it's just, it's not a plug. It's just reality as well. What else, what else have you seen that, so let's say you're an entrepreneur, you're a business owner, you're, you know, 1.5 or $2 million in revenue, you buy into definitely the idea that the consumer, you really have to understand your consumer. Um, what, it, what else would you suggest, um, you know, that would really help that entrepreneur stay focused? Well, again, you know, you want to exploit your relative advantage compared to the big guys, which we've talked about. And so anything you can do to become a part of the community, assuming that you have a physical location, you know, um, uh, whether you're an accounting firm or you sell cabinets or whatever it is, uh, be a part of the community. And we saw this during the pandemic, you know, with some rest, most restaurants were really struggling, but the ones that had been there for 30 years and, you know, were part of the community, people turn out to help them. You know, that's, that's what we want to do to our friends, but not to necessarily acquaintances. So, whatever you can do to move from being an acquaintance, so to speak, to a, to a friend mm. is important. Uh, you know, another thing to remember is that the, when you, especially when you're talking about younger consumers, the, the, the way the communication flows today is very different. It's much more what I would call a, a horizontal flow rather than a vertical flow. So what I mean by that is traditionally we have the companies way up here and their ad agencies, et cetera, the whole, you know, system uh, creating messages that that are top down and go to the kind of the passive consumer. Uh, today we have a much more proactive consumer, and the messages that are persuasive to them are the ones that are coming horizontally from their peers or from influencers, others in the system, not from the store or the service or the or the business. So what you want to do is to take that small loyal base and not only convince them to buy more of what you sell, but turn them into your sales force because they are your best evangelists. They are often a free resource that's incredibly powerful because 
you know, as, as, again, especially if, you know, if I'm it, like your son, you know, if I'm 21, uh, if I see an ad from a store, I'm not nearly as excited as if my buddy sends me, uh, you know, something on TikTok that says, hey, go to this store. It's really cool. So what we want to do is to try to stimulate, not just, you know, think that we're going to ram our message down people's throats, but rather make sure that a multitude of people in the system are singing our praises, other customers and so on. Uh, and if that means, for example, some referral rewards, you know, to your existing customers to bring in new ones or something like that, go for it. Yeah, there, uh, here's a good example, too, of what you're talking about, where instead of going top down with, you know, let's say in this case, a message going bottom up, um, you know, as I mentioned, my son goes to Boston University and when the, the COVID hit, they had the students working, um, a, a select group of students helping to come up with a slogan that would um, help get the word out um, about the testing because BU did uh, two testing twice a week um, when COVID hit. Um, and the kids came up with, uh, uh, you don't have to excuse my French here, but it's uh, F explanation point CK, it won't cut it. So, which, hey, I mean, ex the kids get it. They loved it, mm -hmm. right? So, again, it was F space CK, it won't cut it, right? Right. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's a good example of what you're illustrating where, and I've done this myself. I've done a branding on projects on one of my companies where I brought in a fantastic branding consultant. His name is Robert Bloom. I don't know if you know him, but Robert Bloom was the guy who started Publicis and which is the largest advertising agency in the world. And he wrote one of the best business books that I've read called the inside advantage. And, but we took that book and we all read it. And then uh, we had Bob come in to help work with us to build, um, to build our inside advantage, which was really, you know, a, a culture, uh, uh, what we meant, what we mean to each, to the company, what we mean to our customers. And then out of that can, comes, you know, your tagline and those other things. Mm -hmm. um, but I, it was the best project I've ever worked on. And it was because we got, we got people from different levels in the organization mm -hmm. working together on the project. So I think, I think you're right on when you say, you know, don't have go top down. I think the, the younger people are saying, well, I, I, I would think too, that the, the newer companies that we're, we've been seeing over the years now are less hierarchical mm -hmm. where they have left different levels. They're, they're more vertical. Uh, they're more horizontal. Is yeah. that, you think that's true? Yeah, I, I think that's true. You know, you, you can even see it. I always tell my students that, you know, when you're interviewing at a place, look at the physical layout of of the offices because and things like that, because that reflects the culture, the organizational culture. Yeah. You know, and when you go when you see, for example, Scandinavian businesses like Ikea, uh, you know, I once had lunch with the president of Ikea in North America and he was sitting at a cubicle just next to his secretary. You know, he didn't have a private office. And I thought at the yeah. time that was quite bizarre. So when you look at the open space, you know, floor plans, well, I mean, the COVID coming back to work is a whole other thing. Yeah. But but you, you, you understand that that's that kind of horizontal thinking, anything that allows the people, uh, the organ, the employees to share insights, whether it's and that's one of the big you know, discussions about going back to the office, right? Can we have the kind of spontaneity that happens at the water cooler? You know, can we engineer that into our Zoom calls or what have you? So, yeah, I think it's going to be, um, I, I'm just fascinated by that whole idea, you know, with the, where we're going to go going for, you know, I heard a statistic the other day, 11% uh, of people have worked remotely. And I was surprised how low that was. And I think, you know, I think one of the reasons is, you know, we all, when you're in a white collar upper echelon job, you think, oh, well, everybody's doing that right. when, when they're not, they're you know, not, no. and they, you know, so, you know, 11%, you know, it's not 80%. So that means if it's 11% at the worst time, maybe 5% of the people will continue to work, work remote 
and then the other 95% won't. But, you know, keep in mind, there's people who are in, you know, the restaurant industry, certainly right. they can't work that way. So it, I think it is going to be interesting to see if uh, where it goes yeah. and, you know, how culture gets affected. Yeah. Well, these, again, these categories that we use, it ha- you know, we tend, that's the way our minds work. It has to be either this or that, office or home, for example. Yeah. I don't think it's going to be that way. It's going to be a hybrid where we combine yes. those two, you know. And we're seeing that in the meetings industry now where in-person meetings are starting to come back, but they're building in a big virtual component for people who, who don't want to go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but, uh, but, but clearly that customer experience is still going to have to follow, you know, even if we do more online shopping, which we will, um, you still are not just buying a widget, you're buying an experience. And so the challenge today to, website designers and other tech people is how, you know, how do you create an experience that, that simulates actually being there? And there are ways to do that, like augmented reality and virtual reality technologies and so on. Uh, You know, that's probably a subject for another day, but, but the whole, the whole point is, you know, when you talk about offline versus online, that's in in my book, I talk about that as one of the major dichotomies that we assume exists, but doesn't anymore. So when a business person is saying, do I want to be an online business or a bricks and mortar business? That, that entire question is a moot point because today everything is hybrid. Everything is, is going to be, is hybrid. So uh, it's not a matter of, do I go online or offline? It's how am I going to blend my online and offline activities so that they make sense to people? Yeah. And, you know, we have a couple of minutes left and we got to wrap this up. It's been a very good discussion. Um, I, you know, I think you said something early on, which um, I wanted to, to kind of address. And that is you said, you know, it's you can't just talk to it, you know, like the the owners of the company have to really believe it, that the customer, quote unquote, comes first or that you really, really want to focus on the customer. And I, I had the pleasure of meeting T- Tony Hirsch from um, Zappos. And, uh, he, uh, I, I did, a, we did, he showed us a tour of his operation we spent about three hours with him. And, you know, I, I've never met anybody since then that embodied the idea of customer experience, uh, than, than he did. It was just amazing. And when he got into the level of the details, about what they do. Now, keep in mind that Tony Hirsch from Zappos was the first guy who was able to uncover that, you know, for example, uh, you had to be able to address re- uh, sh- shoe sizes. And when someone goes and tries on shoes, where they used to send you three pairs of shoes, and then you would try them on and you would send them back for free. Mm-hmm. He was the first person who was able to conquer that issue to get people past the idea that they needed to go to a shoe store. And, um, but, but the whole idea of customer service, I really felt that he was the, he really talked the talk and, uh, you know, he, he, of course he passed away and that's, that's a shame. He's, he was quite a person. So, um, all right, Mike, uh, Michael, before we kind of close it out, is there any last thoughts that you have on this topic? Well, I just, you know, uh, just to reiterate what we've been saying, it all starts and stops with your customer. You know, you can have the best run business, the best finance business, but if you don't have people who are craving what you want, you're probably going to have a problem. So, uh, you know, marketing begins and ends with the customer. It's not about systems and processes, et cetera. It's about what people want and understanding what they want and importantly, how that's changing in this rapidly evolving society that we live in. So uh, I, you know, nobody's going to figure it out completely, including me, but it's certainly not business as usual. And and you, you really need to kind of throw away a lot of your assumptions about people today and what they're looking for and ask them instead. Yep. Good stuff. All right. I'd like to thank so very much, uh, Michael Solomon, for coming on today's podcast. If you like today's podcast, please feel free to share it with a friend and also subscribe on your favorite podcasting app. And of course, if you're looking for a line of credit for your business, you can call us at 862 207 
4118 or visit our website at fscreditline.com. Again, that's FS as in Financing Solutions. Michael, if anyone wants to get in touch with you um, or if they want to order your book or do mm -hmm. anything like that, how would they go about doing that? Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I, I, my website is simply michaelsolomon.com um, and my email is michael at michaelsolomon.com. Um, and the, my, my newest book is called the, the New Chameleons, How to Connect with Consumers Who Defy Categorization. And you can buy it on Amazon or anywhere else online that you can buy books. Great. And if our listeners are interested in getting any new business ideas, I tweet daily about lessons for business owners at S Halasnik. It's S H A L A S N I K. And I want to thank you all for listening today. And just remember, you can never go wrong by paying attention to your customers. It's probably the number one most important thing we should all do on a daily basis. Everybody have a fantastic day. It was really good speaking to you today. Michael, great job on the podcast. Thank you.